Thanks for the introduction. So um, Luke made the, uh, the case very uh, early on and very convincingly why we need provably secure schemes or why we need to provide a proof of security for the protocols that we introduce. So uh, in his case, uh, it was like about three years, right, uh, until the proof came out, 2013 or so, the signal protocol was developed. In this case, we're talking about a proof that took 26 years. So, um, yeah, moving on. So um, I am not going to go very well into authenticated key exchange because the previous speakers already did a great uh, job of it. So uh, briefly, what we want is secure communication between two parties. And we usually typically use authenticated key exchange mechanisms. So um, those are protocols that look a bit like this between Alice and Bob or a client and a server. So um, usually uh, authenticated key exchange schemes and uh, secure messaging protocols, they consist of two stages. The first one is the authenticated uh, and key exchange uh, mechanism, which we also call a handshake. And in the second step, we uh, use keys derived during the first step in order to secure the communication between the two parties by usually uh, authenticated encryption mechanisms. So in this talk, I'm going to focus only on the first part. Um, so we, we already saw that typically, um, when we define security in authenticated key exchange, we talk about network attackers, which are able to stop messages, um, um, interact with uh, parties in multiple sessions. They can corrupt long-term secrets of uh, parties, and they can reveal computed session keys. This is the typical uh, Bolaro Rogoway type of um, methodology of uh, defining uh, security for uh, AKE. We're also talking about forward secrecy or perfect forward secrecy, which is to say, even if the key has been comp the long-term key of a party has been compromised, the security of past sessions is not compromised. So, um, in this talk, we're going to talk about a different kind of authenticated key exchange protocol, namely this security model and typical analysis of uh, such security models. Uh, uh, sub such uh, security protocols, they only depend on the fact that you have two parties which you typically both trust uh, to some degree. So you can secure the, 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 the key if the two parties are honest. But in this talk, we're going to talk about a key exchange protocol which is executed by two parties, but out of which one of them is untrusted or only semi-trusted. So this is the case of the AKA protocol, which is used in 3G and 4G mobile networks. So the AKA protocol is, was developed in a bit of a stranger context than, um, say, people who are familiar with TLS know. Uh, in the case of mobile communications, you don't just have two actors, a client and the server. You have typically three actors or uh, three main uh, parties. The first of, it, of which is the client or the user, the mobile user. And then there are two parties to which this uh, client gets affiliated at different times. So a client usually uh, registers with a mobile operator. So this can be Orange if you're in France, or uh, it can be uh, Vodafone, or it can be any other mobile operator. Um, the client is said to trust its operator. Now, I don't know if we physically trust our operators, but at least our phones do. Um, so then, um, then there's also the third party. Whenever the client actually requires mobile services, such as, I don't know, SMS privileges or uh, minister talk or internet access, um, the, the, the client has to establish a secure channel to receive those services with a third entity. And this entity, which I called here a server, um, is just so that we, we have some sort of backward compatibility with TLS uh, people. Um, these servers are called actually mobile management entities, MMEs, and um, they are affiliated either with the client's own operator in the domestic network or, and this is important, in the case of roaming, the server is affi affiliated with another operator, possibly an operator that the client and the client's operators do not fully trust. So. Usually, um, the, the server and the operator may be assumed to communicate over a, a secure channel, which is mutually authenticated, hence the two padlocks. Um, but the client and the server, they communicate over an insecure channel, and it's that channel which the AKA protocol aims to secure. So um, to understand how this works, um, there's, uh, uh, in mobile communications, there's a three-tier trust. 
Um, the operator is the most trusted entity, apparently. So it is trusted to know everything about the stateful protocol, including long-term secret data of client and operator uh, together. Um, the client is only trusted to know uh, the client data, which is usually stored in uh, the SIM card or U-SIM card. Um, and then there's the server, which is not trusted to know anything except the current session data, because it's the server that actually has to provide the service. So it has to know the session keys. There, apart from the security of the keys and the security of these sessions, we also um, need to worry about client privacy. Namely, um, the access pattern of the client should be uh, at least hidden from man-in-the-middle adversaries. The identity of the client should be hidden from man-in-the-middle adversaries. And there, there's quite a convincing case uh, of requirements done by 3GPP on how uh, client access uh, patterns should be hidden uh, with respect to uh, men in the middle. However, um, our results showed that the AKA protocol, which was also standardized by 3GPP, actually does not answer those requirements. So this is the AKA protocol, and you don't need to worry about uh, a lot of the computations. The important part of it is that there are these three parties. Um, in this case, we're, we're just talking about the basic two-party protocol, um, which is um, done by, by the client and the operator. As we will learn in, in the real life, this is actually uh, forwarded from one party to the other by uh, the server. So the basic two-party protocol underlying the AKA protocol is that the client and the server have some stateful information, namely the, the client's uh, secret key, which is denoted SKC, the operator's secret key, which is called, denoted SKOP, and sequ uh, a sequence number called SQNC. This is the state, the client state, which is also um, somewhat shared by the operator, as we will see. And there is some identifying information, which I call here just UID, which is user ID. We'll find out more about this uh, identity a bit later. So the operator has the same information, and what happens is the operator actually generates both the randomness for the session, which is denoted as R, and a number of values, namely an authentication information, uh, MAC op, which uh, authenticates the operator to the client, MAC C, which will uh, have to uh, identify the, the client to the operator, um, as well as some, some session key information. The two keys, CK and IK, are used afterwards for integrity and confidentiality. So those are the encryption and uh, integrity check keys. And then there's the authentication key. The authentication key is used to actually uh, transport the sequence number that is used at every authentication uh, session. So what happens here is that the operator generates the randomness, and as long as the uh, sequence number ba uh, based on which this information has been uh, computed is not too far from the client's own sequence number, the client will accept the authentication and run the protocol. The role of the sequence number is uh, a little bit obscure, but um, what it does is it actually replaces somehow the randomness on the client side. Now, in the 1990s, the SIM cards used by mobile phones did not produce randomness. Uh, even current SIM cards do not produce randomness, but next generation SIM cards will be able to produce some randomness and, and, and uh, do such computations. The problem was there that you had to ensure freshness while only providing randomness from one party. So that's why the sequence number is used. So what happens is the client checks that the values are somewhat uh, compatible with its own stored SQN, and afterwards it sends the response, which is hopefully equal to max C. These cryptographic functions, F1 to F5, they're actually standardized as uh, one of two types of uh, cipher suites, uh, either uh, based on Millenage or uh, on uh, Tuac. So in, the, in case the two sequence numbers are not the same, but the MAC of the operator checks out, there is a resynchronization procedure. So this can sometimes happen uh, when, when the sequence number of the uh, operator was used for other processes, not for the AKA process, but for other processes in the phone. Um, so this resynchronization basically reversed the client's and the operator roles in the uh, key exchange. So the client encapsulates its own sequence number and forces the operator to go back a notch and resynchronize the, it, its own sequence number. So 
now we introduce the third party. This was a, the, the basic two-party protocol on which I came based. The problem is that the protocol is not run by the operator and the client, which both know the symmetric uh, values which are required for this. It's run by the client and the server, and the server is not trusted to know the, the client's key, the operator's key, nor the sequence numbers. So how can authentication work without the server knowing the client's secret? Well, essentially what happens is that the server is only used as an identity management tool. It only uh, basically figures out who the client is and then asks the operator for the rest of the protocol information. It acts only as a proxy with some identity management uh, ideas. So in 3G networks, um, the, the identifier that is uh, provided by the client to the server is either a, a, an international mobile subscriber identifier, MC, which is a permanent identifier, or a temporary one. Now, the temporary identifier is unique, is designed to be unique per server, but two servers can assign the same value by some accident to the same um, to the same client. And in order to make sure that these are unique, you also send uh, your location data with it. So the location data tells uh, the operator which server has uh, issued the TMSI, the temporary identifier. And so you can, uh, you can find a unique uh, client to which this, uh, this temporary identifier was uh, issued. This is important for the privacy. As for, for 4G, you replace this by a different kind of uh, identifier, which does not um, differ so very much in its structure. It also sends some location data and some, um, some identifier data. So the three-party protocol looks like this. So um, you, you start with, a, with a, uh, an identification procedure between the client and the server, whose only goal is for the server to identify the permanent identifier of the, um, of the client and then figure out um, uh, which operator to ask for information. In the second step, um, the, the server will ask for um, inform information for a batch of authentication vectors. These authentication vectors basically provide what you saw a few slides ago, which is all the results of the F1 to the F5 functions, uh, the encapsulation of the sequence number, practically everything. Um, and it does this in, in batches. So um, the operator will generate a number of random numbers and update the SQN at every, uh, every time before it sends the, the authentication vectors. Then there's the challenge response phase. And finally, there's a TMSI reallocation. So here, I, I sort of put it uh, between uh, mutually authenticated uh, padlocks, but uh, it's, it's an insecure, actually, it's an insecure transmission. It's encrypted, but it's not authenticated, which is to say anybody can send it. So uh, there are some security weaknesses of the protocol that I want to highlight. So first of all, you have a weird kind of offline re uh, relay uh, attack that works for server impersonation. Now, this is not a disastrous attack, but it shows that there is a weakness in the protocol. Namely, um, the, the former part of the protocol, which is the identification phase, uh, can, uh, can be, um, you can spot that it's the same client and you can replay it. So basically what you do as an attacker, you uh, look at the first two messages, you let them pass, and for the third one, you, you just stop it. So the next time the client actually um, is, uh, is going to forward its, uh, its identifier, which is going to be the same between the two, notion, uh, the two sessions, so you're going to see it, uh, you, you can just replay the auth authentication challenge and be identified by the client as the server. Of course, you won't be able to, to compute the key, so it's just uh, it, it's, it's a problem with authentication. Uh, but uh, yes, so it, it's still a problem. So there's some more problems with corruptions. Um, namely, the, their, Zhang and Fang showed that uh, corrupting servers can allow a, an, an attacker to reuse authentication vectors and impersonate uh, clients uh, sorry, impersonate server to clients, which is to say that if you have a weak uh, partner, a weak, uh, um, a, a weak roaming partner, um, that partner uh, can, can have its, uh, its sessions corrupted and that information can be used later to extract information from the client. What we showed that AKA guarantees is some client impersonation security, some server impersonation security, and some security of the keys, but where it fails is that um, it, it, does not, it is not robust with respect to uh, server corruptions. 
And there's also this uh, problem with the offline relays. Now, um, there's also uh, the point of privacy here. So um, um, 3GPP requires three notions uh, of uh, uh, privacy, identity hiding, location hiding, and untraceability. Strobel in 2007 showed a parallelizable IMC catcher attack, which shows that basically with just very little effort, you can always find the permanent identifier of every single user in the whole network. All you have to do is re-randomize whatever the, the temporary identifier uh, comes out to be from the client. Because in that case, the backup alternative for AKA is, please, can you give us your permanent identifier? So you can do this for all the clients and all the network at all the time. Now, I'm not going to go over everything because I'm running short on time. The point is that even if you fix this, as Vandenbroek did uh, at CCS, uh, I think, uh, two years ago, you, you're not going to, to solve this. Uh, in, in addition, you have a problem re with resynchronization. Namely, um, uh, you, can, you can trace a, a desynchronized client from a non-desynchronized client, and you can force this desynchronization to happen. So um, there's also a third one by TMSI reallocation, but the whole point is there's no privacy for the AKA protocol. Our counter proposals do fix it, both the security and the privacy. The privacy is more involved and it features um, a more complex uh, type of encryption for the uh, TMSI uh, send sending. But the whole point of this is, is this sufficient for 5G networks? There is the advent uh, of the 5G, uh, uh, the fifth generation mobile networks, and uh, th those will also need the AKA protocol. So there are some, some more important AKA problems than just security and privacy in this uh, respect. Namely, we have some problems uh, with respect to end-to-end -end encryption. It does not exist because everything goes through the operator. So this is something that we should think about. How do we get end-to-end -end encryption for 5G networks? How do we get peer-to-peer -peer communication with 5G networks? This only works for, through the servers at the moment. So all of this uh, has to be solved for 5G networks. So in perspective, the 3G and 4G AKA protocol has limited security, has no privacy. We can fix this so that it has some security and some privacy, but this is not sufficient for 5G networks. So I think just as we have done for TLS when we went from 1.2 to 1.3, what we actually need is the same kind of leap from 3G, 4G to 5G for AKA, the AKA protocol, taking into account speed, because that's very important for all operators, taking into account compliance with the law, and taking into account the new network infrastructure that 5G networks are going to have. Thank you very much.